So for me, what it was is I was doing a little bit of everything and I was just doing it as a way to cope. For, for example, I would play video games sometimes at 11 at night. I'd, I'd go on my phone and play a video game till like two, three in the morning for no reason other than I was so stressed out. And I just wanted to escape, but I was never escaping. I was just continuing to indulge in, in a, in a, another form of getting dopamine. Right. So I had my sales high and then I'd go out and I'd get a high from something else. Then it turned into social media and wanting likes and clicks and followers. And I, when I started my coaching business a couple of years ago, I got addicted to that. So I had this like long problem of like being an addict and I didn't know what the real root cause of all this stuff was. Welcome to the Two Sales Guys Podcast with your hosts, Sean Whitley and Matthew Sokers. What's commonly talked about are the tactics and methodologies for sales professionals. What is less commonly talked about is the stress and anxiety that comes with being a seller. Each day, sales reps are asked to take rejection after rejection, operate in a world of uncertainty and high pressure, and either fail to hit their number or get a higher quota the next year. We'll talk about how to cope with these pressures and what a winning sales mindset really looks like. Sales is often called a performance business, and we'll explore how stress can drive bad selling behaviors. And alternatively, we'll look to experts on how you can manage your mind and wellness first so that you're putting your best foot forward every day at work. We'll talk to professionals in the industry who share the same experiences and what organizations can do to create a healthy, winning sales culture. Today, we're joined by the number one seller at Salesforce, Ian Koniak. Ian manages several of Salesforce's largest enterprise accounts, covering a $20 million ARR territory, and in his over eight years at Salesforce, he has consistently outperformed his targets. Ian is also helping individual sellers and sales leaders untap their sales potential through coaching and speaking opportunities. Today, he shares some of his personal struggles, how he overcame them, and how you can too. For more information, you can visit www.ianconiac.com. Ian, it's so good to have you here today. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on, Matt and John. Um, so I guess as a starting point, you know, you've had an illustrious career in sales for, for many companies, and um, we always find it interesting to just hear how other folks got started into sales. So, so Ian, how did you get started in the sales profession yourself? Well, like many people, I didn't know that I wanted to go into sales. Um, I studied psychology in, in college and I really didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I loved traveling. And so when I graduated from college, I decided to head off to South America and I became an English teacher and I taught English. I didn't speak a lick of Spanish and I headed over there and had an amazing adventure and I got to visit a lot of the state you know, parks and national parks and um you know, uh, went, went camping and hiking and all kinds of just, I lived in the rainforest for a couple of weeks with indigenous Guyanans, just crazy, not crazy adventures. And I fell in love when I was there and my visa was going to run out. And I thought I wanted to be a photojournalist because I had been doing traveling and writing in in South America and, and just wanted to keep doing that path. But I also had this predicament of, you know, how am I going to make money to continue being able to, continue in this relationship. And so my visa ran out and I found myself having to move back with my parents at the age of 23 with no money, no job. I was calling around to Discovery uh, Magazine and National Geographic to try and sell my photos and no bites whatsoever. And I'm like, this really sucks. (laughs) And you know, how am I going to get my my girlfriend here? And so then I started researching jobs and I found out with sales, I didn't necessarily have to have experience in the industry. I didn't have to have a law degree or a medical degree or accounting. I could just go in and, you know, I was always a social person and always had confidence in myself. And, um, and so I started applying for, for sales jobs and I got hired at a company called Lanier, which was a copier company um, that, you know, was basically hiring kids out of college with no experience and training them in, in the school of hard knocks. And, you know, they, they laughed at me in the interview and they said, why would we ever hire you? You're, you were a teacher in, in, you know, in South America. I'm like, well, if I don't succeed here, I'm not going to be able to see my girlfriend and I love her very much. And I need to save enough money to 
bring her to the U.S. and pay for her college because the only visa I can get her is a student visa and support the both of us because my parents aren't going to have us both living in the house. So I need to do whatever it takes to be able to do that. And so um, the power of love is, is a real thing. And for me, that was like, you know, the, the cool thing is when I started, I never questioned why am I doing this? What am I doing? I just said, tell me what I need to do and I will do it. I don't have an option of failing and I just need to, um, you know, basically uh, get this woman here. And, and that was my driver every day. You know, I was always thinking about seeing her and, you know, they just said, here's what you have to do. They gave me guidance. I had a really good mentor and I was able within a year to, to bring her to um, the United States, pay for college. And that kind of launched me um, into the career of sales. And here we are 18 years later. <laughs> Amazing. And, you know, when I was looking at your LinkedIn profile, you do a great job of highlighting the achievements in your career. Um, and, and we're certainly going to get into, you know, your experience in sales and, and viewpoints on the profession and how that's evolved in your career. But as someone that's been consistently a top performer, uh, before we get into some of that stuff, like what do you think are like one or two things that that's really catalyzed and helped you continue to maintain such a peak level of performance over such a long period of time? I think it's not selling skills. Frankly, contrary to popular belief, I think it's very much of the mindset, uh, winners, champions mindset. If you look at top athletes, if you look at top entrepreneurs, they share a common set of beliefs. And I think I share those. Um, number one is resilience. Uh, I, I definitely bounce back quickly. I, I don't look at failure as failure. I my right before I got my largest eight figure deal, I lost my biggest seven figure deal. And I could have been out for the count and said, I said, no, it made me more hungry. Um, than ever before. Uh, a lot of people do see my achievements and they, you know, they saw I was number one at Salesforce one of the years and I followed it up by, by uh, finishing the top five in the enterprise. But what people don't see is that I missed my quota three years in a row before hitting it four years in a row. So I never stopped going. I think continuing to believe in yourself, but more importantly, um, you got to learn from your failures, right? So when I did lose, I always took time and really um, tried to assess where I went wrong and what I could do differently. And, you know, for me, that's the second, um, you know, the second trait of a top performer is, is uh, a growth mindset, right? My, my, even as I'm in this, you know, 18 year now, 18th year in sales um, at one of the top companies, I'm still constantly looking to learn and to get better, right? It's just what I do. I just took a sales course literally on Udemy, um, you know, from, from someone who, who I liked their posts and he had an advertisement for a sales course got in Katie Dorsey. And I saw him on there and I was like, great, I'll take his course. It was nothing. It was like 20 bucks. So just the simple, that that's very common. I li listen to podcasts every month. I, I read an audible. Um, I'm trying to learn about marketing automation for my business. Um, I, it doesn't stop, right? That continuous lifelong journey of being the best person we can be. I think there's no better career than sales to constantly be honing your skills. And if you, if you're tapped out, if you feel like, you know what, I've learned everything I need to, then you can go somewhere else. You can go to another position or you can go to leadership at your company, or you can go to another company if you want to, you know, sell something more complex or go to the enterprise space. So that's the cool thing is even though I've only worked at two companies, I've had, I had, um, you know, uh, I was on the fast track to leadership at my first company. And then in with Salesforce, I, I constantly have been evolving and learning every year. I've had different assignments or different products to carry. And it's, it's been, um, for me, the key is feeling like you're, you're growing, being resilient in your failure. And the last thing is just being all in, right. I'm, I'm not a half in kind of guy. So if I don't, if I feel myself like being half in or wavering, I know there's something wrong. So whatever I got to do to get my head straight so I can be all in and where I'm at, I'm going to do that work versus kind of just drifting along. And ah, do I want something else? Is the grass greener here? That's not me. If I'm going to be somewhere, I'm going to give it my all, but I need to get myself in a headspace where I can be fully committed. Right. And so sometimes that means taking a step back and really assessing where I'm at and making sure that I'm in the right position for me. And if not, I make a change, right. That's when, mm -hmm. that's when I went from Rico to Salesforce because I knew that long-term that wasn't where I wanted to be. And you know, that that's why I decided to go from a leader back to an individual contributor because I wanted to go through that journey. So those are the three things I would say have been huge, huge for me. 
Mm, that's that's great. And, you know, I think it segues nicely into the topic of stress because, you know, someone that goes all in, I could imagine there's been times in your career where, where maybe you've taken that too far. Um, and I think in our conversation leading up to this, we talked a little bit about how you're trying to achieve balance now in your life and, you know, cutting things off and, and committing time to other parts of your life. And so um, it'd be interesting to hear, you know, your journey as it relates to stress and how you've managed that in your career and and also how how you how it's how it's maybe driven some bad habits on your side and how you've worked to kind of change those those habits yeah it's a great question matt and this is something i struggled with most of my life right because i'm an all-in kind of person so my my family has addiction in it you know for better or worse um you know i have my, my father, unfortunately, uh, he died when I was 19 years old and he struggled with addiction throughout his life. He actually got sober a couple years before he died, but it was too late. And, he, you know, he had a lifetime of excess that that caught up with him. My brother had struggled with addiction, my cousin. So I have this kind of in the male side of my family, um, this this uh, addictive gene, if, if you will. And for me, um, it manifests in a lot of ways. I think for me, one was just workaholic. Right. I, I was always like. I remember going into the office on Sundays and working nights and it was like, I just worked all the time. Right. Cause that's what I thought I needed to do to, to get, get ahead. And, and I always had um, my mom to look up to who, who also was a workaholic in many ways. She, she's a professor at UCLA and she was a single mom and worked her way up to um, support both of us and put us to college. And, you know, I always looked up to her in, in that sense. And I kind of, almost like, you know, looked at my dad as someone, you know, I didn't want to be like, right. And, and in doing that, I was kind of denying part of my, my genes and part of myself. And so, you know, there's, there's this kind of whole, whole group of, of people in, in sales. I see it all the time functioning addicts, right? They're just, it, it's not to the point where it's not manageable. In other words, you know, you would never know you talk to them and they seem great, clear headed, but they go so big when they're not working. And, you know, that was me. I was all in when I was working and because I was so stressed out, I needed a big release. And so the unhealthy habits, I mean, when I was 26 years old, I, I got pissed drunk um, every single, probably three or four days a week, right. In, in, in the afternoons. And it was just something I did. I worked hard and we'd hit the bars and that was like the sales bro culture that I was in, unfortunately. And, and that became normal to me. And, and we, I remember just taking these trips to Mexico with our team and just going so big and wild times flipping golf carts. And, you know, this was just something I did in my twenties. And, and I was like, okay, um, this is normal. Right. And then I crashed my tree into a car, I'm sorry, I crashed my car into a tree and nearly, uh, nearly could have killed myself. I and mean, we were going 55 miles an hour. And that's when I said, okay, you know, I got to stop, right? I got to stop this. This is too much. I got lucky. Um, but unfortunately I didn't fully learn my lesson. I learned not to drink and drive, which is good, but I didn't stop drinking. I didn't stop smoking pot. I didn't stop, you know, going to strip clubs and kind of doing this wild, wild side being single. Um, so fast forward to my thirties, I meet my wife, who's the love of my life. And, you know, we have two beautiful children and, um, you know, I, I, I thought, you know, getting married would maybe settle me down a little bit. I thought maybe cause she, she's a Christian woman, strong faith, loyal. And so what I did is I ended up not sharing this kind of wild side of me. I, I tried to play the good guy card and, you know, I didn't do it intentionally, but I just didn't want her to pass judgment or to disappoint her and knowing that there was this other side of me that, um, she wasn't aware of. And so, you know, I, I, I think I tempered down a lot, but I, I didn't necessarily stop some of the things that I used to be doing. I, I think, um, you know, for me, it was a matter more of hiding some of the stuff. So I'd go out, um, you know, and I'd, I'd let loose when I was out of town or when I was enter entertaining clients or when I was traveling and I'd still continue this, but it wouldn't be in front of my wife. It wouldn't be, you know, with our family. And so for me, you know, it, it really was a matter of living a double life in some sense, because my wife didn't know the full you know, the full truth of who I was. And she thought those party days were long behind, but, but, um, long, long gone. But the reality was I was carrying so much stress and I didn't know how to, um, release it. Okay. And a bunch of stuff happened with my family where I won't get into, but I had to come to Jesus in, in the beginning of 2020, right before COVID, um, struck with my family where I started coming out you know, with my wife and telling her some of the stuff that, um, I had done and, you know, I had a guilty conscience and, 
you know, it, it did not go well. Right. It was it was very hard for her to realize, you know, that that I had been not sharing everything with her. Right. And in marriage, you, you should be one with your partner. They should know everything about you. And I, I just kept secrets, not only from my past, but, you know, things that I'd done when I went out of town. And, and so um, once once I saw the impact that had on her and in, in the sadness um, of, you know, truly not knowing every part of me, um, for me, that was it. Right. And so I said, I I'm done. And, and I, I went on this journey of, of sobriety about gosh, like now it's almost 14 months, but I, 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 so my, my struggle was that I didn't necessarily have one thing that was like, I wasn't, you know, taking heroin or getting drunk during the day or, you know, going in, 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 in just, um, gambling all my money away. You hear about people that like just fall apart and lose everything and then they get help. So for me, what it was is I was doing a little bit of everything and I was just doing it as a way to cope. For, for example, I would play video games sometimes at 11 at night. I'd, I'd go on my phone and play a video game till like two, three in the morning for no reason other than I was so stressed out. And I just wanted to escape, but I was never escaping. I was just continuing to indulge in, in a, in a, another in form of getting dopamine. Right. So I had my sales high and then I'd go out and I'd get a high from something else. Then it turned into social media and wanting likes and clicks and followers. And I, when I started my coaching business a couple of years ago, I got addicted to that. So I had this like long problem of like being an addict and I didn't know what the real root cause of all this stuff was. And so about a year, two months ago, I started going to therapy and I'm proud to say, you know, in, in the past 14 months, I've been sober from six uh, of the main vices that I had kind of turned to in, in ways to cope. And, th and those six things were, were getting drunk. It was smoking pot. It was gambling. It was um, pornography. It was Adderall. And it was video games. So I have not done any of that for 14 months, where if you ask most guys and guys in sales, they'd say, how the hell is that even possible? And for me, um, you know, it, it's been nothing short of God blessing me and, and turning to him. And, and it's been a journey in faith and really thinking about, you know, for me, what what is um, my purpose here? Um, and it's it's also been through substituting these things with healthy habits. So I know that's your next question is what are you doing instead? So for me, um, there's just so many things that I didn't used to do that I do now. So, for example, um, every day at lunch, I have lunch with my wife. I block off an hour a day, regardless of what I have in the calendar, to, to have lunch with my wife and connect, right? Not 30 minutes, because that's not enough, a full hour. Um, on the uh, exercise side, I, I am working out every day. I'm doing some form of running or Peloton or push-ups every day, even if it's just 15 or 20 minutes, getting myself in a good headspace. Every day I pray. Um, on Sundays, I go to church with my wife. I, I not to say I'm living a righteous life, but the things I used to do, I really have no interest in because they, I got to a point where they no longer serve me. And so, you know, for me, it's about, it's about a uh, connection, um, making sure I'm connecting with people on a regular basis, especially my family, but also friends and, and keeping connection is, is something, you know, I felt, I fell away from a lot of people during those tough times. And now I'm, you know, reconnecting and building stronger connections. It's about growth, doing things that make you stronger and, and wiser. So, you know, commitment to learning and physically growing, you know, getting stronger, getting healthier, um, learning, and it's about contribution and service, right? Doing things like going on these podcasts that I'm on today or contributing to um, helping men who have trouble with addictions. I, I sponsor men and I help them there. So these are things that I simply didn't do before. And now because they're baked into my day, into my calendar, I just have no time or place or space for the old unhealthy vices that I used to engage in as my default after work because I didn't know any better. Well, thanks, Ian. I mean, first off, for a, like a you know being so honest and transparent about the journey that you were on, I, I certainly can empathize with it. I, I can say that I dealt with some very similar challenges, and um, you know, I also too went through a period of sobriety in the last um, in the last year or so for for the longest period in my life since probably I was eighteen. And I can tell you that I. I wasn't even aware of certain feelings that I had because I'd numbed them for so long. 
Like I wasn't even aware of the stress that I was in. That was actually an uncomfortable period for a little bit because I actually had to sit with those feelings and the stress that I was easily numbing through other avenues before. Did you go through like a similar experience 100%. where it was like, what is this feeling? What is this emotion that, yeah. that I that I would just so easily get rid of yeah. through, you know, whatever? That's that's exactly why I gave up six things versus one thing, right? <laughs> because yeah. when I realized I was still taking the Adderall and that was a way to like deal with the uncomfort of like doing hard work or things that I, I was taking that as a way to get through the day. Right. And like I didn't have to think I can just be a robot. Right. And, and that was really hard to get off because I do have ADD and it was a challenge. But for me, it was I never set out to give up six vices. But what I felt is, you know, this uncomfortable, it's usually anxiety or overwhelmed or stress that I would default to go on my phone or, or look at. So I deleted Instagram and Facebook. So again, people are like, what the hell are you doing? You're taking away all the fun stuff. No, I'm not actually, I'm being able to sit with my feelings now. So now if I feel like that anxiety or I feel overwhelmed, typically what I know is that I have too much on my plate. So the way I deal with it rather than running away is, okay, what do I need to take off my plate? What can I delegate? What can I just take care of now that will make me feel less stressed? I mean, I did this last night, literally. I got, um, I, I had like two or three things I needed to do and it was just stressing me out. I didn't want to go to bed thinking about those things. And it took maybe 10 minutes, right? A lot of these things usually are quick and easy. It's just something you know you have to do. And the more those things pile up in your head, the more you're going to want to escape and feel overwhelmed. So what I've learned is kind of like take things off my plate as fast as they come on so I can minimize the amount of stress than having my plate be too full. Um, but the other thing is I've just learned to recognize when I'm in that place where I feel like I need to just escape. Usually it's just me having too much to deal with and, you know, take it to take a couple deep breaths, take a break, go take a walk. You know, I have, I have better coping me mechanisms that can get me in a place where I can reset and then come back and, and start, you know, hammering out what I, what I need to get done. So I, I think the, the, the recovery journey is very different than the sobriety journey. Sobriety is cutting off something you want to get away from recovery is going towards something you want to be or where you want to become. So I've been very much walking on this recovery journey of trying to be the best version of myself and be an example and frankly, share my, share my story with people simply because I think it's, it's not talked about enough in sales. So I love what you guys are doing. That's why I wanted to come on this show is because you're dealing with something a little different in sales that um, not everyone talks about, but sales is super stressful. If you don't have coping back, all addiction is, is a coping mechanism. That's all it is, you know? And yes, it's genetic. Yes. There are factors that can make one more propense, uh, more, more prone to addiction. But in reality, it's, it's, it's recovery is the journey of learning to cope in healthy ways and recognize when you need to, take a step back or when you need to pause or breathe or just, you know, when, when you need to clear, clear your plate, so to speak. Yeah. I think what we found fascinating through all these uh, episodes is just understanding that everybody has the same problem of where it's like this pressure cooker and you need to find your way that opens up that little pressure valve at the top that lets a little steam out. And like you said, you have to do it progressively over time consistently. It can't just be wait till I'm fully pressurized and then I'm going to go do this one big blow because it'll result in either a burnout or in an extreme uh, not healthy <laughs> option, right? Um, we also talk about the sources of stress because in sales, like a lot of people think like, oh, okay, the job of sales is stressful, but there's layers to that that we've we've uncovered along the way. I mean, mm -hmm. not just your management, but your customers, you put your own pressure on yourself to perform and hit your quota. you got your personal life at home with your family and wanting to provide and, and, you know, be an upstanding father, things like that, all these compile. So it's not like we can just compartmentalize it of like, this is the pressure and stress of work because it all carries over. And so that's why what we're trying to make people realize is they need to find the coping mechanism, the healthy coping mechanism that works for them in all of these facets of their life. A hundred percent. And you're right. It's like, you know, if anyone who has families knows this firsthand, sometimes you carry that into your home when you, when you, when you take it and it's like, you can be short, impatient, snappy, um, distracted. Right. And so th the key is, is, you know, to, to realize like, it's not like, 
work is one identity and then the home life or friends life, like it's all you, you're all one body that includes everything you do in and out of work. And so the way that you cope with work stress is also the way you're going to cope with stress at home. Right. And, you know, just the stresses of life that come inevitably, you know, through, through just life is hard, you know, life is hard. And, and I feel like the, the strategies I've learned are, absolutely relevant to coping as a, as a parent, you know, when, when there's, uh, you know, when there's times where you're frustrated and impatient with your children or in a relationship, being able to have tough conversations and know that it's going to be okay. Again, it's, it's like, I don't know where stress comes from entirely, but I do believe it's from not dealing with what you know you need to deal with. I think that's probably the simplest summary. So if there's a conversation you need to be having that is, um, critical and you're avoiding that conversation, right? Then that can be a, a source of stress. If there's some important proposal in sales or a big job that you're supposed to be doing that um, you're procrastinating on, you're carrying that stress with you. So the habit of knowing and understanding what's stressing you out and prioritizing that first is a critical skill and being able to prevent stress from bubbling up in the first place. Today, we wanted to share with you all about an exciting podcast called Doing It Best With The Rest. Your favorite best friends, Bo and Ellie, share their weekly antics with their listeners. Some common themes that are talked about in the show are love, mental health, college, pop culture, and other countless topics that will grasp your interest. Each week, they have different guests that range from experts in their field, reality TV personalities, singers, influencers, and much more. It's like having a conversation in bed with your best friends, so be sure to join Bo and Ellie for half an hour each week with their off-the-wall opinions, raw personalities, and amazing guests. Find them on wherever you get your podcasts. Follow the podcast on at Doing It Best Pod all across the board. So, you know, one of the other things that we talk about is what is the workplace's responsibility in creating a better sales culture that will actually help with these types of stressful situations? Like, for example, I think it's a manager's, okay, one thing, a manager's priority in sales is to make sure they're constantly hiring the best talent and getting the best out of their talent. And that secondary part there, getting the best out of talent, for me, is giving a safe environment for your team to discuss these difficult and stressful situations so that there can be some pressure release in the work environment so that it doesn't bottle up over time. I mean, what are your thoughts on like where the workplace plays or in, you know, with the changing sales cultures over these years? Yeah, a, a few things. I mean, I think as, a, as an organization, um, you have to see your employees as people first and foremost. I think when you look at them as a number and especially in a sales culture where everything is leaderboards, um, it can be detrimental, right? Because people can uh, devalue themselves based on, you know, where they see themselves versus where their actual performance is, right? So giving recognition and love and, and support to people, even if they're not performing at the way that we know they're capable of is critically important for a frontline leader, first and foremost. Second of all, you need to be able to make it okay to be able to share your struggles. Salesforce is is very much um, on the leading edge of, uh, you know, change in, in corporate America. And we have an organization called Sober Force, which is an uh, employee resource group inside where people are getting support who may struggle with addiction, right? And so being able to have a space like that to say, it's okay, and we're here for you. And you know what? You know, you're, it's not like if people feel like they can't be themselves at their work, it's only going to exacerbate whatever struggles they're going through. So being able to have a place and a space to say, you know what, I have this problem and I need support. And you know what, I'm not alone. And there are other people, even in my company, who can support me and who have walked this road before me, I think is absolutely essential. And then the third thing is like just like programs for getting mental health support. So Salesforce cares is a program that we have, you know, every day that we're, you know, working with, um, and, and Salesforce has these well, well-being webinars that we do, you know, twice a week. And we have, 
people like Jay Shetty on, we have mindfulness, we have monks, we have, you know, people talking about diet and exercise, just actually bringing in thought leadership and expertise to talk about the importance of balance and well-being and mental health outside of work and, and giving, because a lot of employees may not be, you know, like you you and Matt, Sean, where you, you were, you know, aware of this stuff and you're reading and you know about it, right? Some people might not have, um, you go on LinkedIn or, or social to find, find resources. No, they might just be thinking they're walking alone. So to the extent that companies can provide resources and programs for um, of the variety of challenges that their employees have, I think is, is critical, but more, most importantly, it's like, just get to know your people, you know, thinking progressively about how to solve these issues. I, I think that's really cool. And, and obviously, <laughs> um, hopefully there's a bunch of other companies that will see Salesforce, you know, do this and, and follow you. Because I do think that we've seen some apprehension, one with people being open to talking about people's feelings in the workspace. Um, and two, like evolving the culture in sales, because I think that it, in some ways like that may have worked for some leaders for so long to be just so numbers driven um, without kind of thinking about the human beings involved and, you know, not being emotional and, and focusing on the non-emotional business results that a team or an individual or a company provides. And so um, I, I think it's, it's encouraging and exciting that Salesforce and yourself is working on so many cool initiatives to support the change that I think is, is well overdue in the profession. Yeah. And, and again, that's why I want to talk about this because there are people that look up to me, right. In terms of seeing my results or, you know, my history in sales. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're all human. We all have flaws. We all are broken in some capacity. Nobody's perfect. And I think to the degree you try and present yourself as perfect, it's, it's a little bit misleading. And so, um, one of the things when I, when I was going through my struggles, you know, I told my boss what I was going through. My boss said, dude, take care of your family, do what you got to do. I'm here for you. I talked to my boss's boss, same message, take care of your family, take as much time as you need. I talked to my boss's boss's boss. So I was not, I have a very, I've been there over eight years. I have close relationships with, with my leadership and, and I'm, I'm not trying to hide what I was going through. I actually wanted people to know that my performance might suffer for a little bit because I had more important, much, much more important things to tend to than hitting my quota. Right. And that, and that's just the, the space you got to give people. And, the, and, and I'm fortunate that I had leadership that knew what I was capable of and, you know, knew that if I was able to get through this, then I would come back even stronger. And I did. Yeah. I had, you know, a few months where I wasn't focused on work, but I got the help I need. And then I, you know, got on paternity leave. And then I came back and I sold over a million dollars in 12 weeks and I overachieve, even though I'd been out for roughly half the, half the year. So, you know, you got to get people, you cannot do your best work if you can't focus on your work. You cannot do your best work. If you're not happy, your clients will not receive you if you are anxious and overwhelmed and stressed. So the more we can help people find happiness and joy and fulfillment, the better people are going to perform at work. And it starts with what you do outside of work. Yeah. Well, I, I think that there's certainly, I think we're going to see results in caring for people and realizing that people are going to come in and put their best foot forward at work if they're taking care of themselves um, in terms of mental and physical health and, and everything and as it relates to their personal life. So I heard that Salesforce did something as it relates to quotas for COVID. And, and I don't know if that's true or if that was a rumor, but I, I heard that there was like a relief. And um, I, I, you know, I'm in the revenue collective community and, and I saw like how companies kind of looked at quotas and there was a lot of businesses just said, listen, like this is what it is. But, you know, and, and some businesses aren't going to be able to do, you know, to, to give relief. But like if, you, if there's anything you could share about how you guys treated that situation, because Talk about like stressful this year, um, sellers that are selling into territories that may have dried up this year, or people that don't have money, businesses going away. Um, and so like, did you guys do anything to help the reps and the sales community at Salesforce navigate through last year and the beginning of this year? They did. Yeah. This was back in March um, when, when shit kind of hit the fan and Salesforce did two things. The first thing they did is they said, 
we will not be laying off employees. And this was before we knew what the impact was to revenue or to profitability or to stock price. You know, our CEO said, we're not going to lay off employees. Don't worry. You have job security. That was that was a big concern for a lot of people. Um, the second thing on the sales side is they said, we're going to do a, a, a commission advance. So knowing that, you know, we we are not um you know, potentially going to be getting the sales results that we that we thought we would. We are going to pay you fifty percent of your commission up front, even if you sell nothing. So, if your OTE was you know um, one hundred twenty thousand uh, commission components, so just for simple math, ten thousand dollars a month, right? Then you are getting fifteen thousand dollars paid for that quarter automatically without. Uh, without selling anything. So that gave, you know, the idea was like, you still got to feed your families. You still got to eat. Like, don't worry, we got your back. Now there was a clawback. It wasn't just like, Hey, free, free money. Right. If, if you sold that, then you would, you would pay it back. But if you didn't, right, you still got that commission. The, th- the third thing we did is we put a two X spiff on the commission, um, actual, we did that for two quarters right after COVID, right? Q2 and Q3, where we paid double commissions on all deals sold. And that was a huge boost because again, if you're selling half as much, then um, you would, you would make more money. So while quotas were not reduced, we, we did make up things on the commission side and the advanced payment side. And that would, you know, at the end of the day, that's what people care about most is making sure they can make the same amount of money. So if you could sell 50% of what you sell and made the same, same amount of money, then that's certainly a win for, for most sales reps. So I know a lot of people took advantage of that one for sure. That's neat. I mean, it's, it, I, it's enticing me to want to go work at Salesforce <laughs> with the things that you've talked about today. And um, I, I think it's cool. I, I think it's really cool to, to peek behind the covers of what, you know, one of the, I mean, it's basically the best sales company in the world, um, what they're doing to try to keep their salespeople healthy and happy. So I'll let Sean continue the discussion as he fit. But Ian, thank you so much. This was so helpful. I learned a ton and I thought your points on what you did, what the companies can do to help with, with the realities of our profession is, is just fantastic, man. So thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for sharing your story with sobriety as well. And uh, yeah. best of luck to you. It was great meeting you, Matt. Yeah. We always like to ask our guests, like if anybody can get in touch with you or, or follow up on any of the information, I know you have like a, a weekly um, newsletter and other content that you release for, for sellers out there. Where where can our guests um, get in touch with you? Yeah, LinkedIn is, is where I'm living these days. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not on Instagram hardly ever. I deleted my app from my phone. So, uh, you know, there's three places to find me. Number one is LinkedIn. Shoot me a DM or just shoot me a connection request. Everyone who shoots me a connection request, I send them um, a link to my YouTube channel and my newsletter letter where they can keep in touch with my content. You said it every week I send out a new sales training video every Monday or Tuesday. So um, I've been been getting a lot of good feedback on that. Uh, the second place, my website, just ianconiac.com. And then the third place would be uh, YouTube. So I have a YouTube channel. I think we're over, I don't know, maybe over 600 subscribers now. And I put all my videos there. So I do a lot of sales training content, but I, I do talk about mental health. I talk a lot about balance and productivity hacks and, you know, things that I do to um, stay healthy and, and stay happy. And, and so it's kind of a mix of you know, time management and efficiency plus uh, work-life balance plus sales training. And I think sales reps need all of it because if you can take control of your day, you can reduce a lot of the stress. And if you're, you know, if you're balanced in life, you're a lot happier and you're not putting all your eggs in the performance or achievement basket, which so many people, you know, do in sales. So anyway, yeah, just connect on LinkedIn and I'll I'll get you over the, the resources. And if you have feedback or, you know, any thoughts, um, based on what I shared, by all means, just just uh, let me know and I'll try and help you where I can. Yeah, no, I, I like the content. I'm subscribed. And I, one of the more recent ones you talked about, like time management in terms of like, you know, time is ever fleeting. Like it's something that if you don't control what you're spending your time on by actually blocking it out on your calendar and committing to it, like it's a meeting with your top prospect, like you're going to lose track of your success path. and. Um, I think that applies, as you're saying here, to both the professional and personal space, that being able to block out the time for your family or the time for your your physical well-being. I mean, I've I've shifted to working out six days a week in the mornings, and I've never been able to work out in the mornings in the past. I always would throw up after every workout. I was just not. When we did two-a-days in football, I was puking in the trash can after every practice in the mornings. But somehow, 
committing to knowing like the reason I'm doing it is because I want to be around as long as I can for my kids, um, health wise and, and long life and be there when they're older. Um, something about having the commitment of the reason why I'm doing it made it where I'm not, I don't get sick in the morning anymore. And I'm able to push myself because my body knows like you have a purpose, a why of what you're doing it for. And it just responded. I mean, that's just the way I look at it. Yeah, no, for sure. And and I think uh, you probably feel better during the day too. <laughs> you know, after oh, yeah. you do a workout, you're going to, you're going to interact better. You're going to um, be calmer, right? It's not, oh, yeah. there's so many other benefits, but no, kudos to you. That's awesome. Sounds like a good. Yeah. We've, we've talked with some uh, psychologists and nutritionists, chiropractors that have told us all of the physical benefits of just either, you know, breathing techniques or actually working out and all the chemical, you know, releases in your body and what that does for you in all the other areas of your business. And so I think that's important for our audience to hear that what you were doing to cope was the addiction things that would release the, you know, dopamine and other things in your body. And that's what you're then ultimately like chasing to release the stress and, and relieve it a bit. And so if you can find what that is for you in a healthy version that helps a similar, you know, coping mechanism, then that for me is, is the working out in the mornings. I also think it's nice because it's quiet. The kids are still asleep for the most part. So I, I'm, the, I'm the same way. I, I, it's just habitual for me. I'll put my running shoes out in the morning and I get my podcast ready and I'll just wake, wake up usually at six between six and seven, I'm not like a four thirty guy or anything here. Some people yeah. that are super early, but for me, six to seven is fine. And I'll just go for a run. I'll, I'll uh, go on my bike and you know, that sets the, the, the tone for the entire day. And I'll, I'll meditate when I can, I will write in my journal. I'll have a shake, um, an organic meal replacement shake. So I have things that I do to physically hack myself into a, a positive energy rich state that I am hugely, hugely a believer in, right? I think when you don't get sleep, when you're physically drained, when you're exhausted, when you're stressed, you're just not going to perform your best. So I always just prioritize my sleep, my health, my exercise, my diet. And, um, I've seen a big difference and mainly just how I feel in, in general. So I, I, you know, unfortunately I had to go through the knowing what I don't want to, to realize, you know, what I do want, but that's all part of the journey. Right. I, I didn't necessarily have these habits before, but I didn't have yeah. a choice. I mean, for me, it was like, I had a lot more time now. So I was like, what am I going to do with my time? So I just happened to, you know, um, be a big reader and a big learner and hear it over and over again, you know, the importance of health and mindfulness and journaling and all the things that I do. And it works. There's a book called the miracle morning from Hal Elrod. He talks about, you know, how to get yourself in peak state every single day to perform your best. And I'm a big uh, practitioner of that. That's great. I, so congratulations, obviously on uh, sobriety and, and finding your outlets that are, that are healthy now. And uh, not everyone's gotten that. So um, congrats, um, you know, keep that up. And also, um, you know, great job on your mission of, of really trying to help others and spread this message. I mean, that's something very near and dear to us in terms of trying to get this conversation to become normalized in the sales culture that will hopefully cause that shift in the sales cultures more broadly. Yeah, I think one of the things I'd want your audience to hear is you are not your number. And I talked a lot about this with with Sales Hacker. I think the mistake I made throughout most of my career is I attached my self-worth to my performance or my net worth. And if I wasn't making the W-2 I wanted, if I wasn't on the leaderboard where I wanted, I just beat myself up and it was a vicious cycle, right? That's why I went to these unhealthy behaviors because I felt bad and I wanted to make myself feel better. Right. And I, I think it's very common in sales. And, and I do think, again, the, the, the addicts dilemma is many people don't realize that they have a problem where they're in this cycle, right? They just kind of are going through the motions and not feeling good and wondering why they never feel good. <laughs> well, I can tell you, I feel great almost every day, 
not good. Great. Because I'm, I'm, I'm in a place where I'm doing things that make me happy outside of work. And you know what, if I don't hit my number, it's not the end of the world, right? Because I have an amazing family and my relationship is, is better than it's ever been with my wife and I'm healthier than I've ever been. And I'm making an impact in a lot of lives. So I think it's really important to, you know, I have this, this success wheel that I, um, take my coaching clients through where we look at like, how happy are you on a scale of one to five in the following areas? And we look at relationships, we look at friendships, we look at finances, we look at career, we look at growth and contribution. We look at, um, you know, uh, there's a few others, um, mental, emotional, like how do you feel every, every day? And I think if you're putting all of your, you know, I, I got off the phone with someone this morning who was a literally, uh, she, she helped take Marketo to acquisition from, um, from Adobe. And she was one of the original like employees at Salesforce, you know, and has just by all means a successful career in so many areas. And she was saying, you know, she was never fulfilled. She always felt like there, and she said, she sees it all the time and, and CEOs and executives, you know, even if they've had success, they always are chasing more. They always want more. And it comes from this belief that we're never enough. We're not doing enough. Mm-hmm. And it's like this, like this realization that when you know you are enough and when you realize you're doing your best and that's okay is when you could actually start to um, enjoy yourself and, and enjoy life is when you take the pressure off yourself. A lot of times we, we're inflicting our own, you know, wounds and yeah. we don't even realize it. So I think it's really important is to give yourself a little bit of love and realize, you know what, you're doing good and you wouldn't be here up to this point. You made it this far, despite all the shit and obstacles you've had to overcome, you've made it this far and you should be damn proud of yourself. And once you feel good about yourself, then you can do your best work. But if you're always beating yourself up and you're never feeling like you're doing enough, you know, it's, 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 that's a never ending losing proposition. So it it really is a mental switch that is important. And it starts with recognizing and writing down the things that you are proud of and what you do well. And, you know, the qualities that, that, um, you know, that you're, that you're, you know, very, very happy about. So that, that's, that's something that I've had to do a lot of soul searching, but that was kind of the start of it. It was just recognizing that I, I am okay. <laughs> like stop trying to put the pressure on yourself where you don't need to. Yeah, exactly. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing your story and, and joining us on the show. We really appreciate your time. Absolutely. Sean, thanks for having me, man. As always, thank you so much for joining us on today's show. We really appreciate all the love and support you guys are giving us. Again, if you could please give us a five-star rating on whatever podcast platform you listen to, that would really help us out. And as always, please follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and all the social media channels for the two sales guys. Until next time, this is Sean and Matt. Thank you.